Hello? Okay. So, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Alexander. I will be the host. The host means I do nothing. I just tell you what's going to happen next. I basically read what's behind me. So, uh, how many of you have Macs? No one? Okay. Ah, yeah, there are people. Actually, this guy is responsible for one of the applications that you constantly use, and he built it in Perl. So, uh, give it up for Casey. Thank you. Yeah, uh, for better or worse, it's actually the Perl programming language. I, I'm one of many hundreds of contributors. Uh, and I still like that language quite a bit. Um, so thank you for coming to this talk. We're going to talk about deploying uh, machine learning, specifically image recognition software, on Kubernetes. I'm curious, is anyone here interested in machine learning generally? That's good. Uh, and ha does anyone have any uh, experience with TensorFlow or Kubernetes so far? Yeah, a few. That's good. Um, let's get into some basics. Um, we should set st the stage, give you an understanding of who I am, and perhaps more importantly, who I'm not. Um, so I, I am uh, a father. I have three great children. They're very sarcastic, so hopefully uh, they'll do very well in, in technology one day if they want to. Uh, I'm a software architect and a technical lead. Uh, these days, I've been spending a lot of time doing things like uh, rock climbing and acro yoga. If you're interested in any of those things, we should talk. Uh, so those are some things about me. Um, I am an architecture advocate at Google. So uh, I spend time with large companies that have uh, often existing software, which I think we just heard uh, can sometimes be referred to as legacy software. I like to call that the software that's actually making money. Um, and that's OK. Uh, and I try and help them get into the cloud and, and take advantage of it. But today, uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of open source stuff and have a lot of fun there. I am not a data scientist. Uh, do we have any actual data scientists here today? Good. No one is a data scientist here. That's great. Good for me. Uh, I'm also not an expert at machine learning. But that's actually why I was so interested in this project and, and this work is that I don't necessarily have to be an expert in machine learning to take advantage of some of these technologies. So if you aren't an expert in machine learning, but you're being asked often by your bosses or you know, a CIO to use machine learning to magically save your company, then hopefully uh, this can help. So even though I'm not a data scientist or machine learning expert, I think I know just enough to be dangerous. And then hopefully in a few minutes, uh, you will know enough to be dangerous as well. Uh, and that should be a good time. So let's get dangerous. Uh, does anyone know Darkwing Duck? I don't know if Darkwing Duck made it anywhere near here. Yes, excellent. A few people do. Let's get dangerous. OK. So we have a project plan. I want to turn this. I don't know if that's possible. Maybe that's a bad idea. So we should understand the basics of machine learning. Um, we should uh, create a TensorFlow model for machine learning and, and specifically a way to serve that and make it available to applications. Because it's one thing to, to train a model and, and do the work of machine learning, but it's another thing to, to use it and to take advantage of it. So we have to create a model that understands something for us. Uh, we want to create a client application, uh, some kind of application that can take advantage of this stuff. Because again, there's a difference between training a model or teaching a machine and then actually using it. We want to deploy that somehow, and hopefully in a manageable way. I'm going to choose Kubernetes to make that possible. And then perhaps the most important phase of our project plan is to play with it. So uh, hopefully we can do that as well. So let's look at the machine learning basics. So at first I was like, I don't know. You know, machine learning is hard. I don't know how to explain it. But there are some basics here that we should all understand. So. Uh, Machine learning is all about the data. It's all about information. You have to have a pretty sizable amount of information to start if you're going to try and train a model. Uh, so uh, how many folks here have a lot of information, a lot of data? That's cool. Um, so I work at a company that has a few copies of the internet. So we have, we have a little data as well. Um, and you need time. Uh, time is, is absolutely critical. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things I learned through uh, my exposure to machine learning is that in order to train a model well, you often have to try a few times. Uh, it's just like software. You have to iterate. Uh, you, you make an, an educated guess or a hypothesis about what's going to work, and you have to refine that over time. 
And you have to have some, some procedure or mechanism for understanding the information that you have. So starting with the data. Um, we, have his, we start with historical or available data, some kind of information that we have. Uh, and then we often have to break that into, into two groups. So uh, there are a couple of uh, tried and true models for uh, training a machine, uh, training a model. And uh, by and large, what we do is we start with a large amount of information. We break it into two pieces. You could think about this like the 80-20 rule. So we take about 80% of our information, and we use that to train the model. And we take the second 20%, the last uh, chunk of it, and we use that to test the model. So we have to uh, try and train it, and then we have to validate our expectations. Now, you might be thinking that this takes a, a pretty decent amount of human effort to uh, work information into the appropriate uh, formats in order to understand it well enough in order to train a model? And the answer is, yes, it does. It's a pain. Uh, but that's what we have data scientists for. Uh, they know how to do that. Um, I mentioned before that it takes time to train a model, so we have to go through iterations. Also, just like software, where it has a life cycle, uh, it lives and it moves on, evolves and transforms, our machine learning models do the same thing. We start with an initial set of data, an initial procedure for how to understand it, and over time we refine that. We collect more information, we use that to train the model or refine the training of the model again. Uh, and we also uh, often update the procedures for how we can understand this information as well. So when it comes to procedures, this is the entire uh, software delivery lifecycle, but for uh, machine learning models. So we have to discover and prepare that information so that it can be consumed. Uh, of course, we have to have some algorithm for understanding it. Um, and we have to be able to configure that model as well. Um, I mentioned, uh, and I've done this a few times, that this is very similar to the software development lifecycle. And it's important for us to recognize that the active work of training a model in order for a machine to understand something is very much like that process. It's um, very data intensive rather than code intensive, but, uh, but it's a very similar process. So here we go. So we start with getting a data set. We split it into testing and training. And then we uh, train the algorithm. We test it again with our testing data set. And then we ship it out. And we uh, somehow have to make this available and useful to our programmers. I, I'm going to guess, but I'll ask for a raise of hands, how many of us are responsible for potentially taking advantage of a machine learning model? So we don't necessarily have to make the machine learning model, but we do have to use it in some way. Is that many people here? OK. And then how many of us are responsible for making the machine learning model? potentially uh, uh, building something for other programmers to use. OK, so most of us don't have any responsibility in machine learning, which might make our jobs a little easier. Um, also, you know, hopefully this talk will still be fun. If you want to know more specifically about deep diving into machine learning, there's actually a really great five-minute tutorial. Now, I'll tweet out um, these slides so you can get this URL. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but my Twitter handle is down here, Casey West, pretty easy to find. Um, so you can get this URL later, but this is actually a really great introductory talk. Thankfully, uh, we don't always have to do the hard work of training a model on our own. And I mentioned that I'm not a data scientist or a machine learning expert. So uh, there are some models that are already pre-trained. Uh, you can think about this sort of like a package or um, you know, something that's already available, like a library, but for machine learning. Now, this diagram makes it plainly clear how we would train a model for uh, image recognition. Um, and if you don't understand, then I don't know how to help you. Um, that, was, that was a lot of sarcasm. It, it doesn't make it plainly clear. Um, but there is a model for understanding and classifying images that exists already called Inception. And there are several versions. The latest version is uh, version 3. Uh, and it's called Inception because you have to name things. And I know that's not a fantastic name, but you know, programmers. Uh, so uh, this model does image classification, and it uses an academic data set. So it starts with a data set that is a large corpus of images. Um, and the model was pre-trained by experts who understood how to collect that data, break it into uh, model training data and testing data. They have an algorithm for understanding that information. And then we can take advantage of this through TensorFlow as an open source project to make available uh, machine learning models with standard interfaces. Um, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, TensorFlow, deploying and managing TensorFlow and making that available to your applications can be 
kind of challenging. So uh, I decided to use a model or use a, an, an additional piece of software that's part of the TensorFlow open source project called TensorFlow Serving. So TensorFlow Serving provides uh, RESTful or, G or gRPC interfaces for communicating with TensorFlow. And it also provides a few other uh, benefits as well. So we can use TensorFlow Serving to integrate our applications to TensorFlow using standard APIs. And uh, how many of us are, uh, are generally happy about the idea of microservices or APIs in our lives? Um, many folks are. Uh, I saw some, uh, some trepidation. No, not, some people weren't too sure, and that's probably the right mindset to have when it comes to microservices. But generally, uh, APIs help us out. Now, TensorFlow Serving as a software package builds on top of TensorFlow as a core machine learning engine, and it provides some key uh, benefits. So one of them is a continuous training pipeline. I mentioned that there's a delivery life cycle, and often it takes time to iterate through uh, training a model. And, uh, and that can be because, again, you have additional data, or you uh, want to change your algorithm about how you understand that data. So just like software, where we want to build pipelines to continuously manage and deliver software, uh, we can do the same thing with our machine learning models, and TensorFlow Serving gives us that capability. It also has a gRPC interface, um, which is similar to uh, a RESTful interface. It's actually more like, uh, it's almost more like old school SOAP. Does anyone remember SOAP as a protocol? Yeah, we should have drinks and, and a therapy session later if you ever had to do uh, SOAP. But um, there were some good ideas there. Uh, and it's not that dissimilar from the way that we do RESTful APIs now. So how many people are familiar with gRPC? Uh, just a couple. So basically, uh, it's a structured uh, exchange format. So you provide a structured message to a backend system. It provides uh, a message back to you. And it gives you some information about how to uh, send that information over the wire, too. So there's uh, a series of standards around not just the way that information is communicated and how to do that, especially effectively and hopefully with low latency, but also uh, how we construct those messages, both sending and receiving. Um, so it's, it's not all bad. We do that in uh, modern, uh, modern RESTful APIs these days as well. And of course, it's, it's also production ready, which is helpful. But in order to use TensorFlow Serving, we also have to deploy it and manage it somehow. So. Uh, that's what uh, this talk is going to be about pre predominantly. So I mentioned that these pre-trained models exist. We have this concept of, uh, of inception as a pre-trained model for image classification. So if I show uh, this model an image that is clearly, say, an elephant, it should tell me that that is an elephant. It might tell me that it sees a mammal or you know, a four-legged creature or something like that as well. Um, the classification can uh, sometimes be very specific and sometimes not. So let's get into deploying TensorFlow Serving. And this is where things get a little bit complicated. Um, how many of us have ever built a Docker file before? Cool. Uh, many people have. So if you've, if you've built a Docker container, uh, then you'll be familiar with this. So in order to deploy TensorFlow Serving right now, you actually have to build a container and do a little bit of work and it's somewhat manual. This isn't the best system in the world. Uh, but that's sometimes why we have talks like this, to explain uh, the weird, detailed nuance. In order to build a TensorFlow serving model that includes inception as a, an image classification pre-trained model, I have to um, use a pretty big machine. So if we've used Docker machine on our own laptops before, uh, we don't actually get a virtual machine that's quite big enough most of the time. So in this case, I'm going to uh, spin up a machine on, on GCP. It's a cloud provider that's available to me. And I can spin up a machine with four CPUs. And by default, I think it has uh, 15 gigs of RAM. And I need that space and that parallelization to make the build process go faster. Um, so uh, we want to create this image. So once I've got a place to do that, uh, we start by cloning this Git repo, TensorFlow Serving. And then we can go into, uh, go into there, and we can run Docker build. And we'll start here uh, by building a development Docker container. So what we want to do is spin up a, de a developer environment or an environment to, to actually build another container. So uh, we'll go ahead and run this container that we build. 
Uh, and uh, you can see that we're just going to run it here interactively, and uh, we'll get this developer environment. Now, once we're inside of this environment, uh, we have to do a little bit more work. And again, I know that uh, we're used to things just being as easy as Docker run, but unfortunately, with this, it's not quite as simple. So we go in, and, and we have to uh, clone all the submodules. Uh, and then this is the bit that, that is unfortunate right here is that uh, we have to go into TensorFlow and run configure. And if you're familiar with uh, configure and autoconf, if you're a, an old school uh, Linux person, you know that oftentimes you can set defaults uh, using the command line. Or you can just say, use my defaults if you want to uh, with a few uh, command line arguments. Unfortunately, this particular configure script is not ready for that yet. So uh, you have to interactively click through even if you want to choose the defaults. Um, this is something that uh, I'd like to find time to write a patch for. Uh, if you are interested in this and you write a patch instead, I will happily find a way to buy you a round of drinks. Uh, that would be happy uh, for me and for everyone else. So then uh, we use a build tool called uh, Basil to uh, go ahead and build this TensorFlow serving software once we've configured TensorFlow. So now we need to get our pre-trained model into this environment so that it can be served. So there's, this is a pretty basic method of providing it. Uh, you can also provide it with network attached storage or with a storage bucket that's added to um, a container if you want to. But uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is download the Inception v3 uh, built package. And I just have a short URL here so that it fits easily on my slide. But that does go directly to, uh, to the package. And again, we're going to use this Basil tool in order to build the example saved model. So there's a, um, a script called Inception Saved Model. Uh, we have a checkpoint directory, which is the, uh, the pre-trained model data that we've pulled down. And of course, an output directory where we want our, model, uh, our compiled model to go so that it can be served. All right, we're getting close. Now we can get out of this uh, container that we've been messing around in. And we can commit our work. Uh, we can tag a new, uh, a new image here. And we can tag it so that we can deploy it into a container registry. In this case, I'm going to use uh, GCP's container registry. You could easily use Docker Hub or any other container registry you have available. And then, of course, we'll push this container into that system so that it can be made available to Kubernetes later so that we can run it. And at this point, we have our back end. We have a pre-trained model encapsulated uh, with a TensorFlow core machine learning engine. And that's wrapped, around, or wrapped, around, wrapped by uh, TensorFlow serving software, uh, which provides that gRPC interface for us so that we can interact with our machine learning model. Now, I, I should point out at this point that I'm using a machine learning model for image classification, uh, but there are plenty of other models, pre-trained or ones that you can create, which can be wrapped in a similar way. Uh, and uh, we can use uh, pretty similar tools to, to make all that happen. There's also uh, an interface in TensorFlow Serving to manage these models over an API. So if you want to use an API to ma manage their lifecycle, you can do that as well. I also want to say, uh, and I think I mentioned this a bit at the beginning of the talk, but um, training a model is doing the work of, of making a machine learn. And sometimes what we refer to as machine learning is just using a model that's already been trained. So whether you're using an API or you're interacting with TensorFlow Engine uh, directly with a model, uh, if you are uh, using an interface to uh, ask a model to give you information about new data, then you're using machine learning. And if you are training a model so that it can be used in the future, then you're doing the work of machine learning. And there's just a subtle difference there. Oh, now we get to a fun part. So we want to deploy this to Kubernetes. So uh, now we can deploy a model to Kubernetes uh, now that we've got a, a Docker container for our backend. Now, I need a, a Kubernetes cluster to make this happen. And at this point, uh, I'm going to do what I enjoy doing most, which is to do it live. Um, and let's see, we have, oh, we have plenty of time. Yeah, we have about 20 minutes. So it takes a little while to start up a Kubernetes cluster. Um, again, how many folks have run a Kubernetes cluster before? A few? 
They turned off the lights on the audience completely, just as I asked a question for our hands raised, but that was fine. OK, let's do this live. So um, one thing that we can know here is in my container registry, I have this inception container that I mentioned to you before. It's already been built and pushed up. And I have one for my client application as well, which we'll look at in a moment. But before we look at that, um, I want to create a Kubernetes cluster. Now, I'll do this again on GCP. Um, because I, that's my environment I have available to me. So there's container engine here. But I can also use uh, gcloud. So we'll just create a new uh, Kubernetes cluster. We'll call that uh, image recognition cluster. And we'll start with five nodes in the pool. Uh, and this will take a few minutes to create a cluster. I think usually around five. And, and as it happens, just for reference, the, uh, the region that this is happening in is in the central uh, United States, because that's closest to where I live. Um, there are three or so regions in Europe um, that I guess would have made the network latency slightly better. But um, for me, in this case, this is OK. So while uh, this is spinning up, and we should be able to see in the interface here that we've got a cluster spinning up as well. Uh, let's do a little bit of code review. Now, I know it's early in the morning, uh, but I'm going to ask you to read some JavaScript, uh, for better or worse. And I, I hope I can see thumbs up or thumbs down. Can you read the, the uh, screen in the back? Is the code OK? Or should I turn it up? You may need to speak up if I need to make it larger. OK, we're good. I will assume that we can read this. So I've got this basic uh, JavaScript application. Uh, which I want to use to interact with my machine learning model. So what I want to provide is a RESTful interface so that I can uh, send an image to my machine learning model and then have it classified and have that data returned back to me. It's pretty simple. Um, it's not too much. Now, because I'm deploying both the server and the client to Kubernetes, I can use Kubernetes uh, service discovery through environment variables to understand where my backend service is at. So I can use these environment variables, uh, inception service, host, and port to understand where my backend lives so I can know how to connect to it over the internet. Uh, I'm going to write a basic express JavaScript application. And uh, also, I'm going to interact with TensorFlow using this nice library that's uh, an NPM called TensorFlow Serving Node Client. So you can get this from. NPM if you're using uh, JavaScript. If you're using other programming languages, there are many other uh, libraries available as well. And uh, now we have one basic RESTful API here. So of course, at the root of the URL, what I intend to do is start by getting the image URL as a query parameter. So if I just send in an image URL to some image on the internet, as long as I can download it, then we should be good to go. And then I'm going to make, an H uh, make a request um, to my TensorFlow uh, serving model. So I'm going to ask it to predict based on this URL. So I start with the URL. Now specifically, interestingly, in order to send this on, I have to set the encoding to, to null. That's very specific. Uh, but if you want to take advantage of this, you, you can find the source code on GitHub as well. Uh, and once we have an image client uh, and a client body, then what we can do is send uh, a prediction request. And we're doing this through uh, this TensorFlow library here. So uh, we'll start by creating a new buffer for my image uh, client, or my image body. It's binary, of course, because it's image data. And then we'll return either an error or a response, but hopefully a response uh, that we will um, be able to uh, output as JSON. So we will send this JSON that sends information about the URL of the image itself, and also the classifications that we find from the back end. So I mentioned before, if I send in a picture of an elephant, it should return and say that it sees something that looks like an elephant. Uh, the last thing that we do here, of course, is just uh, set up listening on, on a port. And we'll get the port information for where we should listen from the environment, uh, because we're trying to build a cloud-native application of some kind. Let's check back in on our Kubernetes cluster. It's still, still working here. Uh, that's all right. Um, another thing I wanted to show you is I wanted to dive into the TensorFlow serving node client uh, library a little bit just to show you what predict looks like. 
Because if you haven't worked with uh, gRPC before, uh, then you might, uh, might not be familiar. But you have to create uh, what's called a proto buffer. So in order to interact with gRPC, it's a little bit different from REST. But you can see that it's not too bad. Our predict method here, excuse me, our predict method here uh, gets a buffer, which is some information, and a uh, callback function. And you can see that we are going to build a prediction request proto message. Now, this is the, the request we send over gRPC to the other side. Um, so there's a model that I'm specifically trying to interact with. And you could see how this might map to RESTful API design called Inception. Um, I'm specifically trying to call uh, the signature predict images. And then I need to spend, uh, specify some image data. So you can see as inputs, I'm specifying image as a string. Um, you have to specify what's called dimensions. Now, I have a buffer here that's binary. So the size of my image is the length of the binary buffer. And then the value is the buffer itself. So this is how we can just send in uh, the data. And then over gRPC, we call predict again. And uh, then what we're trying to extract here in this library specifically are the classifications. So you can see here that um, we'll call for the classes. And as long as we have some, we'll send them in. So for all of our classes, we will add them to the results. And we'll return that uh, as a parameter to our callback function. So you can see that this is how our application ultimately gets classifications back um, from the responses right here. So that's good. Uh, we're still waiting on our cluster, and that's OK. Um, it might take a few more minutes. Um, the, uh, the other thing to look at when it comes to proto buffers is if you uh, haven't interacted with them before, this is a very basic one. This is a proto buffer for the prediction service, so the type of uh, request we're trying to make. And you can see uh, the syntax here is pretty simple. We're going to make an, an RPC call. Uh, with a particular prediction request, and then it returns a prediction response. Um, as it happens, uh, it also pulls in uh, some information and some signatures from a predict proto buffer, which we don't have to dive, dive into. But as you might imagine, it sort of proto buffers all the way down until we get to very basic uh, types. And then finally, to deploy this application, we have a basic Docker file as well. Uh, I'm going to start just by pulling in a Node.js environment. So that'll be my uh, base container. I copy my application in, and then I run it. Uh, and because this is a highly scalable Hello World application, I'm going to run it with unsafe permissions. Um, you may not want to do that in production. All right. There we go. Oh. Of course. Live demos are always uh, a concern. Um, well, let's see. So what it said was we didn't have enough resources in this region to create this container cluster. So let's see. Uh, let's see if we can try again. And we still have time, so that's okay. I have till 11:15. And otherwise, I will try a new uh, container cluster, or a new environment. So we'll try with just three nodes this time. We have to wait for it to delete. which will take a moment. <sighs> Live demos are always a concern. All right. So while this is happening, uh, we can also review uh, one more thing, uh, which is uh, the Kubernetes configuration for deploying this, uh, this software. Uh, before we do that, I want to make sure that I kick off another deploy here very quickly. OK. We'll give it a shot. OK, Kubernetes configuration in YAML. Uh, 
How many of us are, uh, have read some YAML before? YAML's pretty popular. OK, good. OK, so Kubernetes uh, deployments uh, of services tend to uh, fall into a series of steps. Um, we have to deploy uh, software. Uh, we usually start with a container, and we have to deploy uh, a pod with, for a container, or potentially a pod which has a collection of containers. It can be an arbitrary amount. Uh, and then also, we have to make these services available. So once you deploy some software, it's not necessarily available as a service for other applications to interact with. So we also specify services. And those services can provide uh, things like load balancing and uh, networking capabilities. It also uh, allows for some service discovery within the container cluster as well. So we start by trying to deploy the backend service here. So uh, this deployment. Just for my own curiosity, I'm going to spin this up here. Uh, this deployment is for the Inception backend. You can see that we're starting with the uh, container that we've built for the backend, which has our pre-chain model and TensorFlow serving. And for this container, uh, in order to spin up this particular software, we'll uh, start it up by running the TensorFlow model server. And we'll choose to, to run this on port 9000. Um, we might provide this configuration in other ways if we were trying to be a little more production ready here. Um, but we'll also specify container uh, port 9000 for exposure here as well. Uh, you'll also notice that we'll spin up three instances of our back end. TensorFlow serving can scale up. And you can also use uh, consolidated storage on the back end if you wanted to in order to uh, be a little more thoughtful about your architecture. Um, and then we want to make this service available, this backend service available. So we will uh, also specify a service to deploy. So a service in Kubernetes, as I mentioned, provides things like load balancing. So this particular service um, is uh, responsible for making uh, Inception service, which is our backend, available. Uh, it knows that the backend is available on port 9000 and that we'll also expose it on port 9000. And of course, we'll specify the type is a load balancer. So when you deploy this on a Kubernetes cluster, your Kubernetes cluster uh, usually has uh, access to a load balancer through the cloud provider you're using or the uh, uh, back end provider you're using. So if it's on AWS, this will integrate with ELB. If it's on GCP, it will integrate with the global load balancer in GCP and so on. Um, so that's nice and, and simple for us that we get that load balancing for free. It'll provide a dynamic IP address if I don't specify any other parameters. And we can use that to interact with this backend ser service. And then to deploy our client, which we've also built a container for, um, we'll specify another uh, deployment for pods. So you see that we're going to spin up three replicas or three uh, instances of Inception client. Uh, that's the name of this application here. And you can see that we also start with a container uh, that we've pre-built and is available in the container registry. Now, this particular piece of software will expose over port 8080. And we want a service for this as well so that we can interact with it, both as a human and potentially for other ser software services. So we'll specify a service for this, uh, for this deployment, uh, Inception Client. Again, it knows that Assumption Client is available on port 8080, and the target port is also 8080 for our exposure. And it will also uh, integrate this with our load balancer so that we get load balancing by default. So that's a pretty basic uh, deployment and pretty simple. Um, and all we need now is uh, for enough resources to exist magically on the cloud for us to spin up a, con a container cluster. And if for some reason uh, this one doesn't work, then I will spin up a cluster in another uh, environment. Actually, I may choose to do that while we're waiting here. So let's go ahead and create a cluster through the UI, just because it's available quickly. We'll choose uh, Europe West 3. Cool. OK. We'll do five nodes. 
and create. So we'll get that one up and running too. OK, it looks like we may have a, a Kubernetes cluster, which is helpful. Um, so once we have a cluster, uh, we can list them here. Let's see. Yep, we have got one provisioning, one running, so the provisioning just in case. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, create the stuff that we just discussed. So now we are creating these instances. Now in another uh, tab here, I'm watching uh, some information about our Kubernetes cluster. On the top, you can see our pods. And uh, since this was uh, built from scratch, it has to pull the containers from the registry and uh, get them set up to run these pods. So right now, we're in container creating status for uh, each of those. I mentioned that I wanted three instances of both my back end and my front end. Um, we're also tracking services here. So we can see that we've got services that are instantiated, but we don't yet have external IP IPs on the load balancers. So we're waiting for that. And that's ultimately, uh, we need that and we need running software in order to interact with this thing. And then in the bottom here, we're just tracking uh, the deployments themselves so that we can just see whether they're available or not, uh, which should be helpful. So our backend service looks like uh, looks like we have an IP address on the service. It looks like we have one instance running of our client. And we'll get the rest of these running here in a moment. And just for the heck of it, we'll also keep track of our other cluster here just in case. So I'm going to go into my original cluster. I wasn't planning to do very much here on the, uh, on the user interface, but since we're here, um, Let's go ahead and go to five nodes. So uh, I want to interact with this cluster. I can just use a RESTful API. So I've actually written a tiny little script here called predict. So predict, uh, as you can see, just runs curl. I have to give it an IP address and the URL of an image. And then it will send it to a utility called JQ, which just interprets JSON and, and prints it out in a nice, easy to read format. So uh, I have some images on the internet uh, that we can take a look at. Um, they are in Google Cloud Storage here, and they have public links. Um, so let's load up a couple of these. We can start with the basics, like cute things like puppies and kittens. So we'll start there. Uh, and we'll see whether or not it, uh, it understands puppies or kittens. Um, the other thing that I have is I have a picture of Republic Square which I went and visited um, near sunset yesterday, which was quite pretty. Uh, and I also have a picture of the Vox Days Belgrade team from this morning, which is quite a large picture, actually, from the back of the audience. Uh, I just took with my phone. And uh, the other thing that I would like to do is take a picture of this audience from here to see what the image classification will show. Could I get the lights turned up very quickly? Could I have the lights turned on? Not yet. <laughs> OK. It will say darkness. Uh, let's see what it says. All right. So I have a picture, and I'm going to go through a process to upload this to, uh, to Google Storage as well. So let's take a look at our cluster here. We're still creating these containers. That's OK. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm just uh, I have to go through a rather convoluted process uh, to safely get this thing uploaded. Uh, but what I'm going to do is upload this to Google Drive. And then now I have a picture. It's not too bad. And I will upload this here. Actually, let's make sure we convert this. What even is that? <laughs> let's do it again. OK. Just a moment. You 
Yeah, that file format is very strange, but I guess that's what happens when you upgrade your iPhone and then do this talk. So let's go ahead and take a picture here on this other phone. OK. All right, our cluster seems to be up, and we also have an IP address, which is helpful for our client service. So now, let's go ahead and do our puppy. OK, and it says uh, Chihuahua. It says a Mexican hairless dog. It also thinks it might be a Yorkshire Terrier, which is helpful. Uh, let's do a kitten. Tabby cat, tiger cat, Egyptian cat, cool. OK, uh, let's do this town square. That is quite a URL. A palace, a gondola, also bear skin. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> How about the, uh, the program committee? We can do that one too. So one of the things to note about machine learning models, whether they're pre-trained or not, is that they are as good as the, um, the data that you use to train the models. So now it says stage, cinema, volcano is interesting as well. Um, that's kind of fun. Uh, OK, now we have this image. That's great. So let's download this really quickly. And we'll see what it thinks about this audience. We'll put it up in cloud storage just to make it easy to, to access. Um, I also have a photo of my avatar. So we'll see what it says about that. I'm always reduced to, a, to my t-shirt. So t-shirt, sweatshirt, wig, drumstick. Uh, cool. <laughs> Drumstick. I don't know. <laughs> OK. Uh, and then uh, let's see here. Do we have an image? This will be my last one. We'll upload this image of, uh, oh yeah, cancel. We already uploaded it. Cool. So we'll make it a public link really quickly and copy the link address. And we'll go to this one as well. So of the audience, again, stage cinema, OK, not too bad. Um, so the last thing that I want to leave you with uh, before we, we part ways is that, of course, this is open source software that you can take advantage of. Uh, TensorFlow uh, is at tensorflow.org here. TensorFlow Serving is a, is a part of the TensorFlow project, which you can see uh, here. This is TensorFlow serving at slash serving. Uh, the Inception v3 model is part of academic research, so you can find it uh, easily on the internet. But if you look at, if you Google something like uh, rethinking Inception architecture, or if you go to these slides after I tweet them out, you can also find the, um, the GitHub URL for Inception in, uh, in TensorFlow. And finally, um, if you want to play around with image recognition, uh, you can go to uh, Google Cloud's uh, Image Recognition API. If you don't necessarily want to manage all the software yourself, you do have choices. Uh, and one of the things that we could do is uh, we could upload, for example, um, a picture of me if you wanted to. And there's even more than classification here. Like we can see that uh, there's facial recognition with emotional expression. Uh, labels, like they just thinks I'm hair, of course. Uh, and these things are available as well, which can just be fun to play with because you can just upload images. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I think that we are out of time. We did it. We did some image recognition.
and we can be friends. Um, I think I have, do I have time? Five minutes? Or no? We have, uh, we have uh, one question, actually. One question, okay. One question is, um, how long does it take you to train the algorithm for image recognition? Oh, right. Um, so I start, how long does it take to train the, the model for image recognition? I started with the pre-trained model, um, but to, uh, to build that model, so I haven't done the, the model training on my own, but to build the model and the container, it actually uh, took around 15 minutes with that four core machine. So it actually took quite a while. Um, I tried it initially on my, on my Mac using standard Docker machine, and uh, I just ran out of memory. So. Um, and, and I only had, you know, I think one core at the time to work with. So uh, it does take a while, even with a pre-trained model, just to uh, get everything compiled into a container so that you can take advantage of it, which is a bit of a downside. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. You can, you can always ask more questions there, but you can also rate... Uh, Casey and ask him afterwards meet him. So thank you. Thank you